before I continue, uh, something was said about something, and I realised it was going to come out later, but then I, I just I realised the point of what you'd said. Uh, uh, yeah, that remark of Goethe's, uh, striving out of the whole into the parts, I hadn't re read it that way because I read it dynamically. But striving out of the whole into the parts does not have the whole coming into the parts as separate from the whole. Uh, the parts are the unfolding of the whole. It strives out of the whole into the parts. The whole unfolds into parts, so the parts are the unfolding <coughs> of the whole. It's entirely within. It's a dynamic movement within. It's not that the whole comes out into some parts. And that. It's not like that at all. And of course it never occurred to me uh, that that way of looking at it, because I was thinking in Goethe's way, dynamically. Um, if you separate the whole and the parts, then you've got a problem. Uh, and of course the language could perfectly well encourage you, striving out of the whole, you're going out of the whole, into the parts. But, that, so that, and this will become clearer as we, as we go on. So there's, there's, there's no need to worry about that. But you said about that, and you said, I couldn't get it at first, and then it got me. I realise what it was. Uh, but it will come out more. Is that okay? Um, oh, this book. Here it is. This is Stefan's copy. Don't tell him. It did tell him. Uh, this book has just come out. And um, it's, I've met the man who's done it. And what happens is, it's full of the wonderful photographs. These photographs of plants are put in the book at exactly the place where Goethe refers to. These are not spurious pictures. These are the plants that Goethe refers to at that place in the book. So there you have it. And for the first time, Goethe's book has actually been published as he actually wanted it. This has just happened this year, last year. Um, the thing is, Goethe had hoped, if you see the actual one that Goethe did, it's just like a kind of pamphlet. Uh, it's, just, it's actually just a, a, a list of a hundred and... You've got the last one there, 120 or 124, I don't know, paragraphs, numbered paragraphs. That's all it is. 120-odd numbered paragraphs. And it looks very dull and very boring. Um, 107. <coughs> what is it? Oh, 121, 123. Um, and I've, you've got 120 on yours. Um, but that's it, just numbered paragraphs. And uh, it looks very boring. Now, Goethe had hoped that the book would have drawings in it. But that, that was never done. And he did say he hoped one day an edition would been done like that, and now it's happened for the first time ever. So it's very interesting, you see the life of things. If we were going into the hermeneutics, we'd go into this, but I don't know how far we'll get with that. But uh, things actually grow. People think of a Goethe's metamorphosis as something that happened in the past. It isn't something that happened in the past. It's actually something which is, which is in a process of growing historically. And Goethe's book is more now it has become more now than it was when Goethe did it. Uh, we would look into this if we have time on Friday, or th I don't know when, uh, but I'm not sure we'll have time um, because it's very interesting. As a matter of fact, what we're going to do on Goethe's dynamical thinking of the one and the many will actually enable us to understand something about how a work grows in time and becomes itself more. So it's... it's uh, there is an enhancement of being of a work over time um, and this is t to be taken literally and so Goethe's work now is more than it was then and this is part of it coming into fulfilment, coming into expression so things are not in the past uh, as soon as I said the past is the, is the missing body of the present it's not missing in the sense it's like it's the invisible body of the present you can't understand the present without the past because the past is the other side of the present. Um, and it, this book only costs £15. 
something like that. And I had something bottom of this. I, there is a, a there is a thing on the back which actually is it's a, a quote. I, I did this. I wrote this down. What happened was that the publishers got in touch with me and said if they sent me a copy, not before, before it was finished, would I write a comment? And um, I, I can't. This is a bit awkward because I'm not actually really the Goetheans. There are so many Goetheanists, and I'm not actually a biologist. And I thought, yeah, but I did write that book. So uh, I sort of got to think, well, I, sort of, I suppose I, I, I ought to say yes, so I did. And they sent me it. And I went through it. Uh, I put it aside for a week. And then one day I, I thought, oh, I know what to say. And I wrote this comment, and I thought, they'll extract from this. And I put, Goethe would be delighted with this edition of The Metamorphosis of Plants. He does what he hoped would eventually become possible and provide pictures situated in the text of all the plants to which he refers. So that we can see for ourselves the specific points to which he is drawing our attention. Reading it, I felt that here at last is the complete book, compared to which all previous publications of it seem like only a skeleton. Thanks to Gordon Miller's wonderful photography and careful selection of images, as well as his perceptive introduction, we can now all appreciate the extraordinary nature of Goethe's achievement. We can only be astonished at the detailed and painstaking observational work, together with the overall vision of the idea of metamorphosis, which biology today recognises as the truth of the plant. This welcome edition makes Goethe's work more widely available than ever before, both for those who have not yet had the opportunity to read it, and for those who have to read it, for those who have read it, to read it again as if for the first time. And I, I thought they'd extract something from that. So when they finally sent me the book, and I looked on the back to see if they'd used my comment or part of it, I was flabbergasted to find that's the only comment they'd put on. Um, <laughs> which I knew that they were chuffed, because I got an email from the published MIT saying they were really chuffed at what I'd written. But I didn't expect that. Of course, I was horrified, because I thought of all the Goetheanists and all the people like that who are the great experts on this, and they're going to be, really find that very annoying. I would have thought. Anyway, never mind. I did meet the man who did it, Gordon Miller. I met him in August, and he was very pleased with what had been said there. So that's all right. What's Thank the you. title? Oh, The Metamorphosis of Plants. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. It lives. It goes on. It develops. It grows. And now with that, of course, it can even more... <coughs> okay. Where am I? I'm here. <coughs> Just give me a moment, will you? Okay, we've seen that Goethe talks about the modification of one single organ. He talks the process by which one and the same organ presents itself to us in manifold forms. And this is what we need to understand more deeply. In various letters and in the diary of a journey he made to Italy, he says various things. He says that he is becoming aware of the form with which again and again nature plays, and in playing brings forth manifold life. And the thought becomes more and more living, that it may be possible out of one form to develop all plant forms. And notice that he does not say the form with which nature plays again and again is nature's model or ground plan of the plant, just as he does not say he's trying to reduce all plant forms organs to one form. He says, 
it may be possible out of one form to develop all plant forms. That is not saying that he wants to reduce all plant organs to one form. Uh, it, you can see that quite clearly. Yet again, on another occasion, when referring to the organs of the plant, he says, it had occurred to me, this is in a letter to um, Herder, it had occurred to me that in the organ of the plant, which we ordinarily designate as leaf, the true Proteus is hidden, who can conceal and reveal himself in all forms. Now, when you read Goethe, it's difficult not to get the sense that he's doing the very opposite of searching for what all the different organs have in common. He is actually talking about the creation of difference within unity, not arriving at unity by the exclusion of difference. His thinking is entirely the other way around. And the reference to Proteus gives us a clue. As you know, and Proteus occurs all around the world, I know, in different forms, the Greek god who can hide and reveal himself in any <coughs> form he chooses. He can present himself in manifold forms, ever differently, and yet it is always Proteus. Now, we would not try to understand Proteus by collecting together different manifestations and trying to see what they all have in common. Such a procedure would be far too late. What's essential about Proteus is the coming into being, the appearing and not the specific form in which he appears. The attempt to find a common identity based on the different appearances would only result in an average Proteus. And what a stupid idea that is. <laughs> would take us very far away from the ever-dynamic Proteus. So, clearly, Goethe does not want to look at the organs of the plant and find what they have in common, excluding all the ways in which they are different and only including the ways they are the same, until at last he arrives at an average organ, which is the common plan according to which they are form, formed. He doesn't do that. He's not looking for an average organ, the common plan from which they are all formed, in which all differences are removed to find what is the same. Uh, that would be a very strange thing, because it would be reached by excluding all differences, <coughs> and therefore from such an organ no difference could ever emerge. If you make an organ, as it were, by excluding all differences, then clearly no differences can ever emerge from that organ because you've made it by getting rid of all differences. So you've gone into a cul-de-sac. And that's what happens in books when you read it about Goethe. They just go straight into a cul-de-sac. But what they do is they stop before they hit the wall at the end. And therefore they, that enables them to get away with the fact, get away with it apparently. And so this is what Goethe was doing, and then so they bang, they stop before they get to the end. You only have to think it through to the end to see you're in a position of complete absurdity of trying to see how differences can be produced from an organ from which you have excluded all differences. It's a self-contradictory thing. So, what <coughs> Goethe's not beginning with the finished organs. You know, I like. I think this sort of picture of things that uh, people describe this. And if you can imagine, what you can do with the organs of the plant is that you can take them off the plant, pull them off, uh, and then you stick them on a on a card, a piece of paper, sort of up in order, and all the different organs. You can put them all there, and you can actually put them, and then you can survey them. And people think that what Goethe did was that sort of thing. And then he looked to see what they had in common. And he'd say, oh, yes, if I... That one there. Now, if I, if I miss that bit out of that one, and if I, if I take that bit out of there, then those two are the same. And now if I, if I exclude that bit from that one there, they're the same. And eventually, he pulls off this unity. I found the unity in the multiplicity. Wow. But actually, he's not doing that. He's... That, that, that starts with the finished organs. I've got them, I've got them here, I'm standing like this, because I've got them here, on a screen in front of me. 
and I'm standing back and I'm removing all the differences to find the unity in the multiplicity. That's not what Goethe is doing. He's not doing that. He's my exercise for the week. He's <laughs> on the other side of the screen. And he's coming, for him, but coming into being to end with those different organs. He brings them back into the unity from which they originally went forth. He's on the other side of things. So his thinking is the very reverse of what we are doing. And that's the key to the whole thing. <coughs> he goes back upstream. And that's what he means. <sighs> that exhausted me. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he means by working and alive, striving out of the whole into the parts. He goes back upstream from the organs in the finished state. So he doesn't derive the unity from the diversity, but he brings the diversity back into the unity from which it then goes. So it follows, the, it's the same dynamic, as the thinking is the same dynamic as we have with the phenomenology of lived experience, but now in fact applied to the plant. Uh, we can do a, a sort of diagram, it's probably time for a diagram. Um, if I think what happens is what I've just been doing uh, you're going to start with the organs of the finished plant there's a leaf that's nice uh, what sort of remnant I can't draw them by the way no. oh. that's a petal oh. now let's have a stamen oh, that, that's a stamen that's a stamen right those are the organs, and there are, this is the plane, call that, finished organs. That's the plane of the finished organs. Oh, what the usual way of thinking does is it tries to abstract a unity from this. like that, by finding out this is the unity of the finished organs, <coughs> which is what is common. What Goethe is actually doing is he's looking at the dynamic unity of coming into being. And so he's actually coming down There. So, this is downstream. This is further downstream, going back to the picture we had on the first day, and this is upstream. So now we come to the phenomenon from the dynamic unity of coming into being, which then we'll see in a moment, rather than trying to find the unity from the finished organs, which removes all difference. Okay.
very often, because people don't recognise the difference between these two, they imagine he gets a kind of common plan. And they say, well, this is what Goethe imagined was at the origin of things, this common plan, from which, as I've said, nothing can come, because you've made the common plan by excluding everything. So, but they, what they do is they, people project this backwards. They project this as if it was up there. They imagine that this unity of the finished organ is what is common, is actually there at the beginning, they project it. And they say there is that higher unity from which things come, but nothing can come from that. And that's the kind of thinking which uh, Rumi described as the kind of thinking that tries to get to the milk by way of the cheese. And that's what, again, if you look in what counts of Goethe's work, you can see time and again, that's exactly what people are doing. And there's bedevilous things. They take a kind of metaphysical picture of this, and they imagine that this unity here, because the idea is always, unity is higher. We, we're obsessed with this idea. That unity is higher than multiplicity. Unity is fundamental. Uh, and so we tend to look down on multiplicity as being somehow the inferior. And so if there is unity, it must be higher than the multiplicity, it must be superior, it must be beyond it, behind it, and the multiplicity comes from, is a lower kind of thing. It is all, this is built in very strongly to um, a certain prejudice in the Western way of thinking, Western philosophy. I mean, I'd like to say it goes back to Plato, because everybody does say that, but as I've already mentioned, Gardner said that Plato was no Platonist, and that's where the problems come. I haven't got time to go into that. But careful reading of Plato shows that rather like with Goethe, he was not actually saying what people believed him to be saying, though he did himself, like Goethe, contribute to the misunderstanding by the way in which he did things. He later tried to correct for that, but people didn't understand his correction and simply thought that he was criticising his own earlier work. In fact, what he was saying to people was, you've misunderstood my own earlier work. And they got, so the whole thing's a bit of a mess. But this whole platonic metaphysics of this two-world philosophy is, um, the whole of Western thinking is, is infected by this, because also of its later associate, um, ado adoption by Christianity, and you've got the Christ uh, you know, Platonized form of Christianity, with, which is strong dualism, of higher and lower and so on. And so we have an almost inevitable tendency to think <coughs> in this way. And so we take this, think that this unity is somehow that when you found what is common, you found the unity that's higher than, than all the differences in the multiplicity. So we must project it to a higher realm. And when you do that, then you get that's the basis of the metaphysical attitude. Before you know where you are, you'll be in that. And then you're in trouble. But the whole thing is actually a mistake. Uh, we saw it with the phenomenology. There's nothing behind the appearance, but there is the appearance itself, the happening of appearing. To think of then that there's something behind it is to miss the appearing, which is the real, ontologically the real thing. So we have another example of this here. And that, that brings me to this, uh, which is a very, very fundamental thing. Uh, I'll stop at a certain point later in time for people to um, ask questions, make comments and so on and that. I want to reach a certain point first. Okay, we've got that picture then now. Um, what I want to now, well, all the time, I'm just going back into it again and into it again and into it again. And each time I see something further about it, there's more to see here. Because one of our great problems, well, it's not a problem for practical purposes, 
very useful, is that um, we think in terms of what Henry Bergson called the logic of solid bodies. Um, and in that case, the defining characteristic of the logic of solid bodies is separateness. Everything is separate. So we'd say, in, in that case, No, I'll leave that. I've got that. I've got that completely out of order. Sorry, I think uh, I'm beginning to get. Yeah, sorry, that's my fault. I'm going to. What I want to draw attention to now and talk about is what I would call the self differencing organ. Uh, hyphenated, self differencing organ. This is the key thing. We get this then we're, we're well away. <clears throat> if one and the same organ presents itself to us in different forms, then each organ is that organ, but differently. It's not another organ. This is the business about the logic of solid bodies. It would say, well, there's one and another one. There isn't. Proteus is always the same Proteus, but differently, and not another Proteus. A Proteus appears in one form, and then there are not two Proteuses. It's always the very same, and not another one, and yet it's always becoming different from itself. It's dynamic. A way of putting this is to say, it becomes other, without becoming another. It becomes the other of itself and not another one. This is all kind of language that's developed to try to express this. So Goethe's one and the same organ manifesting as different forms is a self-differencing organ producing differences of itself. So the different organs we see are the self-differences of one organ. We see different organs, but there's only one, self-differently. And this is an extraordinary idea, <coughs> this idea of self-difference, instead of self-sameness. It's the idea that something can become different from itself whilst remaining the same as itself instead of becoming something else. And when you go upstream into the coming into being, it's this self-differencing organ you discover, which appears downstream as several different organs. That's the whole point about the logic of solid bodies. The, the logic of solid bodies, which informs our thinking, which has the form of separation and number. You look at it and you'll see several different organs. But actually, it's not like that. You have to see that each organ is actually the very same one. There's only one. And actually, what happens is, as we'll see in a moment, you have to learn how to think within the dimension of one, in, in which you have multiple without there being, or multiplicity without there being many. It's a story idea. Ah. Uh, uh, as I, I've mentioned already Deleuze, who you don't know of, but never mind. Um, uh, he had this remark where he said, I like this, there is other without there being several. Already you can see here, you're thinking in a pre-numerical way. You're before number, you're before separation. There's other, and yet there isn't several. Thinking in the logic of solid bodies would say, well, if there's other, then there's got to be more than one, so there's several. <coughs> it, it's, it's obvious, it's logical. But actually it's not like that, because your upstream is before that. There's other without there being several. And so what we've got is that the unity of coming into being is the dynamic unity of self-differencing, in which difference 
is now intrinsic to unity. Now that's astonishing. Because if you look at the way the one and the many, unity and diversity, has been discussed for, what, 2,000 plus years, it's all been the case where difference is excluded from unity. If you look at, for example, what it, the laws of physics, the way they're thought about, if you take Kepler's laws of planetary motion, let us take, oh, I don't know, uh, oh, no, I don't want to get into this, but what... Well, take, uh, what do I take? In the laws of physics, individual cases are, are not. Do I want to say this? If you take something like Kepler's third law of planetary motion, <coughs> which says that if you've got a circulating system of planets around a central body, then of course they'll all have different radiuses, different orbits, they'll go around at different times. And if you look at them, if you look at the planets going around the sun, their orbits look completely different. <coughs> but Kepler was able to show that if you take the radius and you cube it, and you divide it by the time it takes to go around squared, r cubed over t squared, it's exactly the same in all cases. And this is astonishing. And if we were, at the time of Kepler, we would think this is the most, as they did, this is the most wonderful, extraordinary thing to discover. And it is. But if you look at it, what you get from the form of thinking is you, the very form of that law says this is the respect in which the planets do not differ at all. This is the respect in which the planets are all the very same as each other. So, although you don't notice it, time, you're thinking of finding a unity from which difference is excluded. And it looks miraculous, and it is. And so much so that, I mean, for Kepler, it was quite clear, this was the thought of God. He discovered God's thinking. God thought the universe in this way, because this is how these guys thought at that time. And we, of course, have become so accustomed to this that we think of this unity, and again, because you see, the unity is higher. Where is the hi higher law? It's in God's thinking. Can't get any higher than that in a Christian society. So, really, that unity is now put into God. Um, and you can't argue with that. Um, so, <coughs> when we come to this discovery, uh, but in fact... Here we have a kind of difference, sorry, not a kind. Here, difference is intrinsic to unity. Then that is actually completely remarkable. And it actually goes much more than we might think at first. And it goes completely against the grain of the way people have been thinking for a very long time. And this is what you come to in the first place when you start to think in terms of life. You remember Hegel, the aim is to find... I forgot what I said. What did Hegel say? Uh, just a minute. Hegel said, to understand life in terms of life itself. And this is what Goethe was doing with the organic. This is what we were doing with, actually with the lived experience, but it didn't, didn't seem that way necessarily. When you, and this is what happened from the beginning of the 1800s onwards. In different ways, it's a movement towards life. And we've not really got this idea properly. Because what we usually do is we try to reduce life to something non-life and explain, I'm thinking now of the organic, or even people, uh, in, in terms of what is not living. But the real step is this, that people, uh, there's a kind of thinking being developing which is in accordance with life itself. It's one way of looking at it anyway. <clears throat> Here, we're dealing with the living plant. And we find that unity now has difference within it. That's just extraordinary. Um, that's the... the um, I've nearly finished this bit. And then it'll get slightly easier. The, in this case, the unity is the very dynamics of self-differencing. So if you think of self-differencing, the differencing is the unity... That's just 
Cuban saying so. That's bloody remarkable. And therefore, <coughs> the unity, concomitantly, is the differencing. Ah, oh, I've just said that the unity is the differencing. It's the complete opposite of everything that, that we have. So, when you get to the self-differencing, the self-differencing is the unity, so the unity is the self-differencing. And that way of thinking is the opposite of the unity of the finished products, which is the static unity of self-sameness. The dynamic unity of self-differencing on one hand, the static unity, that's this one, the static unity of self-sameness. And that's what we think of in unity as in the most part. And we reduce, of course, what you're doing in that is you're reducing unity to uniformity. And an awful lot has been said about that. And people try to look for ways out of this in all sorts of ways. Funnily enough, one way people don't seem to look is the organic way. Um, so there we are. Difference intrinsic to unity instead of the exclusion exclusion of difference, finding unity by the exclusion of difference. <clears throat> now, before I go any further, you might perhaps want to say something. I'm going to explore this to help you think about this last bit. I'm going to help you to think about this a bit further. The step by step, <coughs> each step goes over the same, but differently. <laughs> and uh, somewhat deep, more deeply. You see, when you get this, you can go over the same thing again and again and again, because each time it's, it's the same thing being done differently. But somebody at this point might want to say something or ask a question or whatever you want to do. Yeah, yeah I just wanted, um, talking of Kepler's uh, third law we asked about over T squared, how is that excluding the differences, surely by the nature of that equation, it's, in, it's inclusive of the differences in terms of the observed planet. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't quite... Yeah, that is also true. But, but what I was talking about there is the way this came to be perceived. Oh, okay. If you're doing it mathematically, which is what you're talking about, mm. then yes, all the differences are included in there. Yeah. And therefore you could say what I've just said here about mathematics. But in fact, the way it's perceived is when, because people begin with the, the result, r cubed over t squared is constant, not seeing the mathematics of that, the mathematical thinking, then they begin with that. And <coughs> that, from that point of view, the difference is excluded. I did hesitate, you notice, about giving that example. And that's why I hesitated. Um, and I... I think it's, I'm glad you brought it up because I think actually I will, I will drop that kind of thing in future because it is a problem. Yes, you can look at mathematics both ways. So. But in, culturally, how it influenced us was definitely in the, the way I described. Yeah. People don't see the mathematical way of thinking. It seems to me in, in biology there are lots of examples of this kind of thing, which is, is the kind of natural way of looking at it. For example, the idea of a, of a stem cell. Yes, yeah, stem cells. Yes. Uh, and of course, enveloping the different. Yeah. Organs. But there's there another interesting thing. You were talking earlier about how a rose goes from its uh, uh, wild state, so the stamens apparently uh, develop backward, almost regress, I think was the word, back into petals. But, uh, there's, there's some examples in, in, in biology that's just sent to, to check out charts with animals. I'm thinking, for example, of, of insects. Uh, you know, the, the, the almost all insects, or all forms of insects, have two pairs of wings. One exception is, is a group of insects called the diptera, the flies. They only have a single pair of wings, but over time, through evolution, the, the hind pair of wings have developed into a set of balancing organs mm. that they call haltiers. And so they fly perfectly well, in fact, they fly even better because they've got this kind of gyroscope mm. which they can fly. But in, for example, fruit flies, which is an example here, there's a mutation by which, in a single step, the haltiers regress back again into wings. Oh, lovely. So you end up with, with a fly which has got two pairs of wings. Lovely. Quite, quite, quite uh, <laughs> uh, different from that. Or another example is that of hen's teeth. Hen's teeth? Hen's teeth. Oh, yeah. uh, hen's teeth. 
you know, or hands are called sapiks, they're birds, okay? okay? But from time to time you have a mutation by which birds, uh, the hands themselves, half of the chickens, have teeth. Now, of course, this goes back to what I would believe, that birds developed from reptiles, yeah. and the reptiles, of course, have, have fully fledged jaws with, with teeth and so on in them. And it seems that in a single step, by this one mutation, the hens develop the teeth like, like a lizard or a snake. Yeah. Now, what's interesting in this is this, this idea of, of, of the, the whole expressing itself as a part. In some ways, it's believed the hens still have all the instructions, the genetic instructions on how to produce the teeth, but it's become suppressed. Mm -hmm. Somehow, the evolution of the, the, it's all there, all the information, the, the, the intrinsic ability to produce teeth, but it, they don't. But this regresses back in the same way the stamens regress back in the yeah. head. Thank you very much. I think that's absolutely lovely. Um, I, I, I have a misfortune. I, I struggle when I talk about these things because I'm not a biologist. And I never did biology. When I was at school, you had to choose between, phys you, you, you had to choose between physics and biology. Mm -hmm. And at the age of uh, 14, 12, 13, 14, I chose physics. Because uh, my dad said do physics. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, fine, I've done physics. Um, and I loved it. But I never did any biology ever, and I do feel the lack of it. My wife's a biologist, which has been great, because she can fill me in on all sorts of details. So you leave the data, it's not true anymore. You don't have to, you're not forced to make that artificial choice anymore. <laughs> no, I know. Even in British schools. I know, even in British schools. <laughs> I know, yeah. And, and so when I hear examples, I, 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 it just thrills me what you say. Because what is interesting to me is that <clears throat> all this is there, but nobody, as it were, you could sublime this into a way of thinking. And nobody does. They do this in the biology and they get this, but they don't see there's a whole mode of thinking here. Which you know what I mean by sublime. A whole mode of thinking. That doesn't happen, does it? You see, when you met the, I met the professor of genetics, um, and I remember when Craig Holdridge was here, we discussed this a lot. Um, it all gets done now, but nobody sees the idea. They don't get the idea. They don't see the idea. They don't experience the idea. And this is what you do when you work in Goethe's way, because it's kind of, Goethe's way is a kind of phenomenological way of working. And then you experience the idea, because when I say see, I mean experience, the idea. And then you see it's a kind, it's a, it's a, a way of thinking, and you start to be in that way of thinking. But the, in biology, it doesn't happen, does it? It's all kept outside, isn't it, really? You're still very mechanistic. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, is this. It's all these examples are there. And it's a stem cell research. And uh, stem cells is it. I mean, I've got a footnote, I think, on stem cells, because my wife said, you must do that. And I mean, I do know people, some, some people are so confused about what's done with stem cell research and stem cells. There are people who objected to me mentioning stem cells because it was associated with stem cell research, which they didn't didn't, didn't agree with. I mean, you, you, this is a minefield sometimes, you know. Um, anyway, thanks for that. You sort out yourself who's going to talk. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I just had an interest, interest in um, how we all come to understanding. And I was seeing the parallels between what you've been talking about in terms of biology and what's happening on a personal level um, in terms of understanding and clarity. And it seems to me that um, your work and your thinking is unfolding um, that's happening because all the parts, which is us, become more and more clear. So there's a more and more clarity about the concepts that you are sharing with us as that's happening that seems to sort of merge together and then there's a sudden sort of sort of leap forward of the group knowing of something. Because from the first day now to the third day, the first day there was a sense of what could that possibly mean? What what does what, what did he actually say? Quick let's write that out. What was your note there? And the writing mm -hmm. down of each other's notes in terms of trying to get the exact words. And then in our little discussion groups uh, people brought their own ideas. So mm. it was outside of this classroom mm. that then brought sort of more openness. So it almost seems like that that there's a unity and understanding mm. that comes from the parts, not comes from the parts, but it emerges from the parts of the 
so the understanding becomes emergent and it see, it, what I'm interested in is this idea that there's a sudden leap forward they just sort of mm. somehow if, if the majority of people are holding some form of clarity we suddenly all clear yes. and, and it, it's fascinating it's like the hologram really um, in that mm -hmm. sense yes I mean I think it, it is like that and um, I mean I don't do this kind of stuff anywhere except at Schumacher um, I have done things in the past, but I mean, I'm too old a book now, and, and it, it doesn't work. Uh, you, you, the thing about Schumacher, and the way I keep coming back since this thing began, is because uh, I found that at Schumacher, uh, it's reciprocal. They found what I do beneficial and what, what they wanted, even though knew, nobody knew what it was that I did. Um, and I find it beneficial to come here and do this, because it can be done here. Because this is the kind of place where what you have just described happens. Now, if that doesn't happen, I mean, it's, I can tell the difference. If I'm talking to you, and that's not happening. It's like I'm, I, I can't describe it. it it's, it's like running uphill. It's dodgy. It's and I feel dragging this out and out and there. And that happens at Schumacher because the conditions are here for that. So, it, it, and I always say, um, that um, I keep coming back also well I come back actually because if I don't Stefan has a nervous breakdown but uh, <laughs> after that, <laughs> and, and, that. <laughs> and, um, the thing is um, uh, it, with the work that I am doing when I come and work here with it I see further um, every time uh, and so that means, so I don't come here just, oh, I've got, I've got to shoot my gun and see further. But the thing is, um, that, that's a sign that it's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. And that's what you describe. It's like it becomes that fragment of a hologram and it begin, the whole begins to appear in that way. And you do it through your own <coughs> connecting it. It's right. You connect it with your... I, think, I remember when I met Gradama. In 1986, when he was 86, one of the things that he said to us was about uh, Heidegger. He said, Heidegger had no idea how people could use his work, but he wanted them to do that. And he said he wanted people to take what he did and find how to use it in their own way, in their own concerns. And later on, at the end of his life, he was giving seminars to doctors on, 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 on his work. And he said he had this moment. He said he didn't want people going around quoting Heidegger. He wanted them to see how to do it in their own way. And he said this phrase, almost this, because his English wasn't too good. Heidegger can be happy when he is not quoted. <laughs> you know, it's where he, he didn't. And of course, that's what they do. Everybody quote, quotes this, that, and the other. They paraphrase Heidegger, uh, Heidegger, and so on. So this is this idea that you can come to see things in your own terms, and that's what people should be doing here. I mean, we were talking earlier about this. Um, it, what I'm doing here, I do phenomenology and I do Goethe because that's what I do. That's what I know over, over decades. It could be something entirely different. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not doing this so that you would start doing that because that's not your cup of tea. That's not what you're involved in. Someone might do, it's happened to me, David Seaman went into phenomenology because of what, a course I gave him in the early 1970s and he's done a lot since then. That can happen, but that's not the point of it. The point is, it's the, these are carrier waves for the way of seeing, the way of thinking. If you pick that up, then you see in that way in whatever your concerns are. And that's, that's it, you can forget everything else. And that, that's that's what comes with what you've just been talking about, where we begin to see by bringing it also into our own, our own concern, <coughs> our own words, and our, our own interests. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. So that's a very good clarification, actually. It's very, very good indeed. Uh, people sometimes get muddled up about this. striking that well part of me wonders if 
there's, you know, a sense in like, you know, we're losing the Western. Sorry, I missed that. I said, part of me wonders if, you know, as we talk about Western society or Western science, if it's not, if the, if there's some people that it's not that they don't see this way of thinking or don't know that this way of thinking is there, but they just utterly choose to ignore it because if we all realized that you know the, the unity in, in the self differencing the way that our society functions couldn't function anymore at all like we couldn't have you know capitalism or we couldn't have you know we couldn't we operate so individually and so separate that if all of a sudden there was this you know if everyone just accepted this and this universal clarity happened, then our society would just like collapse and people hold on to the, the way that we have been living and, and that, um, therefore, I don't know if I can, you know, I, I don't know, I'm trying to explain something, but it's hard to articulate, but so that if we all saw this way or work this way, that's how everything would be solved or <laughs> seen. Know, yes, you know, what you've just expressed perfectly is the, the optimism of youth. <laughs> uh, and I understand that. I was, I was once young myself. Uh, uh, the thing is that um, don't underestimate uh, the other side. Yeah, yeah. Don't underestimate the forces um, because they're very, very strong. There are very many people who do not want this. Well, that's what I'm saying. And they want the capitalism. They want the separateness. That's what they want. Yeah, and they see this as a... They wouldn't want this at all. And this is a very, very strong thing. It's not just a question of, well, if they saw this was according to life, they'd change. No, they would not. Yeah. And that's, that's, what, that's what you're saying. Yeah, it's exactly something what I'm saying. resistance and fear of actually realising um, an alternative way of saying because the house of cards that creates the current status quo would go, mm. would crumble, and people don't want that to crumble. That's what you're saying. Mm. Mm -hmm. But it yeah, yeah, wouldn't yeah. then look the opposite. It may, it may even look the same, but the approach towards the differences would be softer, and 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 so the how one is approached. So I don't see it as necessarily meaning change in the world system. Well, it's not going to anyway. It's a different, yeah. a different holding of the differences because the differences yeah. are the same as the whole. The, the differences are the, the whole. So, so these differences which capitalism brings about or individualism or materialism would remain, but in a different holding mm -hmm. space as having mm -hmm. less importance. No, I see what you're saying, yes. Different mm -hmm. way of being. Mm -hmm. so, yes, I see. I don't yes. see them as that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. That is interesting because um, uh, very often what you find, or it seems to be, that there is a place for everything. Right. It's just that things are out of their place. Mm -hmm. And some things become hypertrophic, mm -hmm. in which case they grow to beyond what they should be, as like the ego and so on. And that. <coughs> and that doesn't mean that they shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. but it means that they shouldn't exist in a hypertrophic mm -hmm. state. Um, and of course, I, I suspect it's, it's like that, um, more than it is of, of a, a, a... Well, I don't think it's an either-or, we, we, we're going to change to another kind of state. I don't think so. Um, because, uh, I mean, the whole thing is bound up so much with the institutions and them and those what, which are absolutely necessary uh, for us to live and survive. We can't... Um, We all, we, I think we underestimate that, that aspect of things. I always think of a story about, someone told me once, that the thing about the mammals, the emergence of the mammals, that these tiny little shrew-like creatures uh, were running around at the same time as the dinosaurs. Um, and, you know, if you'd said to a dinosaur, hey, you guys, look at that, that's going to take over. I mean, you know, come on. Um, but that's it. Uh, mammals developed. And uh, dinosaurs, for some reason, <laughs> didn't go any further. Um, they were hypertrophic for a start. Uh, that's pretty clear that dinosaurs were hypertrophic. Um, I would have said, anyway, gigantism and all that lot. Um, so maybe there's something in that. Um, but I don't know. 
Uh, basically, when we got older, I think the main problem is, you would hate this, just keep keeping things going. It's just so difficult to keep things going that you've got to be very careful. Just keep keeping things ticking over is so so difficult. Um, you won't like that. You want to change the world. But I sometimes think now that just if you just keep things going, that's quite an achievement. Mm. You know, looking at daggers at them. <laughs> 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 Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Sorry, I misinterpreted the look. Misinterpreted. <laughs> <laughs> But well, that's by the way. Anything else before we yeah. lose? Well, um, when you say keeps things going. Well, that doesn't matter really. I mean, that wasn't part of the course. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you manage to keep things going? To, to keep this with the other things going? I mean... Uh, I don't. How, how do you manage? How do you manage to go into everything and develop it and start to think in this new way of thinking, mm. and at the same time keep everything going? I don't know. And does the does the the action of keeping everything going does that help you to to go to clarify and to keep keep your own process? Well, I mean, look. We're in a building. Oh, there's not enough light in the room, so I switch the light on. Where's the light come from? It's come from the electricity supply. Mm. Okay, we don't agree with the electricity supply because it's warming the planet, so we want to stop the electricity supply and we want to do something else. So let's get rid of all the power stations. Then what's going to happen? You can't put the light on. Mm. You haven't got a refrigerator. You you can't cook if you're cooking by electricity. Okay, you can go out and get some wood and make a fire. It's not going to work. Yeah. And there are millions and millions and millions of people. Mm. Uh, right now, we've got a computer-dependent society. We have lost a huge amount of flexibility. I think, actually, this will cause a problem at some point. I don't think we'll escape that, but that's by the by. Um, even if you don't think about that, we're all dependent on, you turn the tap, out comes water. Mm. Well, the, you know, you don't need me to tell me there are parts of the world where you might have a several mile journey with some cans to get water. If you do that, then there's an awful lot of other things in life you can't do. And this is one of the problems. Because we have these things, we may not do things which are worthwhile, but we can do so much more in life. Life can be so much more because we have these structures. Mm. What really matters is structures. Um, institutions are structures. Mm -hmm. Now, institutions can become negative. But they may not begin in that way. Let me give an example. Um, the idea of a corporate body, um, which a lot of people point out, I mean I remember there was someone here who thought the most wicked and evil thing in the world was the existence of corporations, corporate bodies. But in fact, if you look historically, corporate bodies emerged really quite a time ago, um, round about, I suppose around about 1200, some not quite a little bit earlier. The idea of a corporate body emerged actually funny enough as a possibility within Roman law. And this hasn't been noticed. In law, as again, if we've gone to the hermeneutics, we go into this, there are always poss more possibilities <coughs> that have been actualised. Mm. And you don't know what those possibilities are 
until there's a context within which another possibility can emerge. They don't, you can't look and see if oh, there's a load of possibilities. You can't, they're invisible. They don't come into being, they don't appear until there is a context in which they appear. And there was a context in the church that the church had this problem about the, the, the princely powers were, get, were, get, were having too much effect on the church. This is, of course, the Catholic Church. There only was the Catholic Church then. And they wanted to find some way of liberating themselves from these princely powers. And they found this, this, this little bit in Roman law which meant that you could institute a corporate body where that body was treated of people, was treated as one whole. And there was not individual responsibility uh, and not individual accountability, but the body itself was taken. So what, you, you know the idea. Yeah. Well, then of course, naturally, once that had happened, the princely powers spotted the same thing. Well, what I want to get to is this. Um, the people have had this question quite a lot recently about why is it that when science developed so strongly in the Islamic countries in the Middle Ages and originally the work that we had here came from the Islamic countries consisting not just of um, texts of Aristotle and so on and that which was translated, had been translated into Arabic and then in, into Latin and so on but also of a very highly original work in science done in Islamic societies. Why did it then take off in the West, whereas it ceased in the Islamic societies? This is a question that people have had at the present time. And one solution that's been put forward to this is because of the development of the idea of a corporate body. Because when you have that, you can have scientific societies, or you could have guilds, first of all, that people of different backgrounds could all come together and work together as a corporate body in which there was kind of protection. The individual was not, um, uh, could, the individual was sort of protected. But also people from different, different areas could come together, different interests could come together and work together. And that would work. Now this didn't happen in the Islamic societies because it's contrary to the Sharia. And it didn't happen in Islamic societies until the colonisation in the 19th century by the West, when some Islamic societies then adopted this corporate organisation. And then you can do things which you can't do otherwise. And now, as you know, one of the problems with fundamentalism is that they say there shouldn't be that, because it's non-Islamic, yeah. and therefore that should be destructured and so on and that. But <clears throat> there are some people who think that because Islam didn't have that notion, that people couldn't come together socially and work together because it was all done by individuals. And they had no protection either because there was a lot of problems. They, let's say, at a certain point, the Islamic society, the, 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 the legal people, they, they turned against the people doing scientific work. So a famous mathematician, for example, actually did his mathematics um, as part of the mosque. And the trigonometry was developed because he could argue it would lead to better ways of finding the true direction of Mecca. And so on and that. Um, so there's an example of what I mean by institutions and institutional development making an explosion of development possible. Um, and we're dependent on that. We are all being, we're not individuals, we're, we're all being in the midst of being with and so on in a social way. That's an example I have. Yeah, it's because in the last few days I have this idea well, I wrote, I wrote a quote of Jung that says, the wrong way is always the right way. So I was thinking about this youth optimism of save the world, and in fact, we just don't have to save ourselves. It's like this kind of idea of destruction that always has to come when a new world would be born when we have to to give life to a new world, then we have to let it go. We have to let the other die. So it's this, when you said, let's keep going, um, it's like, just let go, or just live with that, because then it's kind of, it would 
with this hypotrophic, it would destroy itself, it would die, or even it would emerge something else just by, just by living it. Mm -hmm. mm. So it's not, yeah, it's like this idea of, because when we think of the environment in a, such a attached <coughs> way, we're just, well, I, I think we're doing great things, but also we're like not letting go something. I don't know what exactly. Mm -hmm. So mm. that's what, like, what's going, that's okay. what I wanted to Thank know. you. Okay. Mm. Context, context, mm. yes. And I think our very context is that we're able now to see the terror of capitalism, mm. materialism, and, and the hardness of the industrial mm. uh, in life. We're able to see it so clearly now, be, and and that to damn it would be a, a mistake mm. because from this very context now comes all these possibilities. Mm. You know, if I'm just repeating really mm. what you no, no, saying, you I know, just have no. all these possibilities. Of, no. of possibilities of mm. new approach of a new way of being. Yes. We can't damn what's given us the chance to see. Yeah. Very good. Mm. Yeah. 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 We wouldn't have been in this position if it hadn't been for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is right. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this is very, very good this discussion because it shows that, to me, it shows that people are not thinking in a simplistic manner about this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Quarter of an hour. <coughs> I think I'll just to say, well, I'll just finish off by saying a couple of things, <coughs> uh, which I was going to, where are I got to? Oh, I know, yes. Um, well, <coughs> this, um, I want to go back to this, uh, one of the many, um, see, in order to think this kind of thing adequately, We've got to learn to think, um, what, I would, what I call think intensively instead of extensively. Now I'll have to explain what I mean by that because it's rather important. Um, intensive doesn't mean they're intensive in the usual sense of, oh he's very intense, isn't he? Um, I'm going to give an example of a hologram. When holograms were first developed, um, they would be on glass plates. And they were often very big glass plates, and you would look through them. I remember one exhibition where there was a horse galloping towards me, and it was so real, apart from the fact it was pink, um, <laughs> that I felt I had to jump out of the way. Uh, jump into the next hologram and smash it, sort of thing. <laughs> um, and look, that's how they were done. Now, at the, this is the early days. It's not like this now, the way they're produced. But supposing we had something like that, and supposing that was mine, and you looked at it and you said, God, I really like that. Where can I get one? I would say, oh, that's no problem at all. Here, I'll give you one. And I'd break that glass plate in half and give it to you. And you would throw up your hands in horror and say, no, 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 so you've ruined everything now. But the amazing thing is, <clears throat> when you look through the bit I'd given you, the whole horse would be galloping towards you. And then the bit I got left, the whole horse would be galloping. Of course, it's a bit of a narrower window through which you're looking. <coughs> but that's it. <coughs> now, if it was a photograph, or a photographic plate, we had photographic plates the other day, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> 
And, and I did that and broke it in half. That would be useless because you'd have half a horse and I'd have half the other half of the horse and that's no good to anybody. So if we look at the hologram, then we say, if, if I have a photograph and you want it, I can do it. But I have to make a copy. Now when I make a copy, there are two. There's one and another one. But with the hologram, there aren't two. There's still one. Because you divided it, but it remains whole. Each is the very same one. And they're not even different in this case. It, you, what you've got is one and the other of the one, not one and another one. We're, we're actually here in a non-numerical situation, but we usually don't notice this. And we think, this, in this case, we'd say, well, there's two. And there are, in terms of actual, the physical glass plates. There's one there, and there's one there. That makes two. But actually, each is the whole. And so, optically, there's only one. And there's one in the form <coughs> of two. And I call this multiplicity in unity. It's the opposite of unity and multiplicity. Multiplicity in unity. There's a multiple within the unity. And there can be that without fragmenting the unity because each is the whole, each is the same one. If you, I find it useful, this image. <coughs> you have to follow it through in your mind. If you work through it yourself and you imagine doing it with a hologram, then you imagine breaking a photographic plate and you imagine making a, a copy of a photograph. These different things. And you just do that, picture it to yourself, and you say to yourself, well, what is the difference? You can begin to see the difference. <coughs> and I think <coughs> this is... The, so what we've got in the one case, where you've got one and another one, so there's two, that's an extensive distinction. Where you've got the case with the hologram, where the, there's really only one, but not one in the numerical sense then that's an intensive distinction. And self-difference is an intensive distinction. The difference of one thing from another thing is an extensive distinction. These terms are actually taken, they, they're used in mathematics, but they come originally from medieval philosophy. Um, and they're useful, I find useful anyway. <coughs> and there are many examples of this, this kind of thing. I mean, you can think in terms of a, vegetative reproduction of plants. If you take, I'm told, if you take a fuchsia plant and you break a bit off a leaf and plant that, then it will turn into another plant. So you can take a leaf and break it into several pieces, plant them all, and they'll all turn into fuchsia plants. And you can see them all in separate pots. So they look separate and you see, see that there. But actually, each plant is the very same one. <coughs> That's a multiplicity in unity. We see it as several ones. Because we see it numerically, we see it extensively. We see it as several different plants. But actually, there's only one plant there. And it's a multiplicity in unity. <coughs> and that's an intensive dimension of one. And when the, the, in writing about this, I put one with a capital O there, but you can't when speaking. <coughs> you get an intensive dimension of one. So what you're actually doing <coughs> with this kind of thing <coughs> is you have to think within the dimension of one. You, this is what, again, you go upstream for this with the plant. This is before the multiple is separated into many. And you can see it both ways. You can see it as many plants, and that's the numerical way, the extensive way, or you can see it as one plant, as a multiplicity and unity, in which each is the very same one. You can see it in the dimension of one, or you can see it in the dimension of many. If you see it in the dimension of one, you have multiplicity without it becoming many. If you see it in the dimension of many, you always have many different ones. Now you're in the realm where you can count. And one must, one must practice this. Practice going backwards and forwards between these. You can see it both ways. Both ways are true. But usually we only see it one way. 
And our thinking is all done in terms of the logic of solid bodies. Whereas here, optically, here organically, we need to think in this intensive way of self, of, well in this case multiplicity and unity. I don't say self-difference because there's no difference here. Each, each is really identical in that sense. And of course the, that nice example is, uh, you know, if you take something like a potato, if you take the king egg of potato, then if that, uh, you know how potatoes are made from other potatoes by planting potatoes. So if you've got a variety, you don't allow it to flower and, and all that stuff. You plant more potatoes. So if you take the King Edward potato, the question is, every time you buy King Edward potatoes, you're buying the same potato. And there only is one King Edward potato. You go to the shop and there's many. You try going to the shop and buying King Edward potatoes and say to the shop, did you realise there's only one potato here? <laughs> <laughs> See how far you get. Uh, and, and if you think about it, that original King Edward potato plant has turned over time and over space into billions of tons of potatoes, all of which are one potato. That's multiplicity and unity. Now, it's there in front of us, is this. We don't think in this way, but we need to develop this. And just by practicing this, going from the intensive to the extensive, back to the intensive, in your mind, visualising it, you will develop a capacity for seeing, which is exactly what's needed for understanding Goethe's one organ manifesting itself differently, because it's intensive, not extensive. In the Goethean case, of course, we now have difference. And you can make, you can make things for this. The duck rabbit's a nice one. With the duck rabbit, you've got the duck rabbit. The whole thing is the duck, the whole thing is a rabbit. That's an intensive difference. It's not duck and rabbit, that would be extensive. We did this yesterday. And you can say, I'm going to separate them. I'm going to draw a duck over there and I'm going to draw a rabbit over there. Try it. You'll have a duck rabbit there and a duck rabbit there. You can't get away from it. You see? Um, and then you could imagine a kind of duck rabbit figure which had many other... Well, you can't do that. You can with a hologram. You could make holograms in which you've got several whole pictures at once. And the hologram is the only you can have a hologram of a horse. And if you change the angle, you can actually also put on that the whole thing, a hologram of a cow, or the hologram of a rhinoceros. And then if you actually move the position of your head slightly, it will turn from a horse to a cow to a, a rhinoceros. And so this, of course, is, is artificial. But you can do that. And you've seen these things on building some advertising sites. When you go past and suddenly it changes one thing to another. There you've got there you've got obviously got you've got there a difference. You've got diversity there. Now I'm not bothered about that. I'm just saying that the kind of thinking that you need for understanding Goethe's one organ manifesting in different forms, the self diff the dynamic unity of self differencing, is you need to think intensively in this way then you see it. If you don't, you think extensively, you, you just have many different organs. Okay, so that's something you need to add on, and you can practice that until we meet tomorrow, because I'm off now. I've got to go. I'm going out to lunch. I'm out, I'm out to lunch. Mm. <laughs> <laughs>